please. My name is, is um, Meg Deus, and I and Susan Fisher and Keith coordinate the lecture series. You have your loop monitors. Are they, are they working okay? I can get a sound check. I imagine they're working okay, yes. Okay. Um, a few details before Keith introduces Patrick Graybill, our lecturer. First, our um, discussion group is in the visitors center. From, it's, um, it starts at two and it goes until three. Um, the next thing is there's a sign up sheet right here and I want people to write your names and addresses and if you want notes, write that, write that also. Can we write it to the end of the presentation? That's fine, that's fine. But I want all of your names. Okay. Thank you. What? Oh, another question. <laughs> Our note taker is Sam. Is it S C H E R E R? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, and our interpreters are for voicing. Um, your your sign name is Aaron. <laughs> and for um, the ASL interpreting, it's Aaron Brace. English. The next lecturer is Tori Armour, and that's on, I have to check, February 16th. It's a Tuesday. Um, we have more brochures right here if you need them. That's all. I think that you know the purpose for the lecture series, and that's to introduce new ideas and research to you for using in the classroom and in your own research. And I hope that you get that kind of information. Anyway, now it's time for Keith to introduce our lecturer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you're all familiar with Patrick Rabel's sign name, which is PG uh, on the chest. I've known Patrick about seven years, and when I read his Vita, Curricula Vita, I was amazed. Uh, also, I, it means we have three Aaron's here today. His middle name is Aaron, so it's really interesting. Patrick was born. And as his mother was considering what to name him, he has two older sisters. His oldest sister is deaf. And they were considering calling him Pat. They were thinking for a middle name and named him Aaron. Then later on, Pat was telling me a story about his middle name. And I thought perhaps he was Jewish. It was confusing because he was so involved in the Catholic community. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Later, I met his mother. And we checked with his mother to find out why his middle name was Aaron. I was told none of his business, possibly from his father, maybe something related with the mailman. I'm not really sure. Patrick grew up in Kansas, attended the Kansas School for the Deaf, graduating in 1958, and then went to Gallaudet College, where he got his BA in English.
He also worked at the Kendall School for the Deaf in Washington, D.C. as an instructor from 1964 till 1967, and then pursued an acting career with the National Theater of the Deaf from 1969 to 1979, 10 years. That's where he really picked up his signing expertise. Then he came here to NTID in 1979, hired as an assistant professor, and he's been working here since. Patrick has much experience as an actor and also translating plays from English into ASL. He has extensive experience in ASL and drama, and he's aided with many translations for the plays here at NTID. He also teaches a course in translation from English to ASL related to theater. Today, he'll be speaking on translation into ASL. So let's welcome Patrick Grable. Thank you, Keith. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here presenting today. I'm not sure if this information will be entirely new to people or if you're already familiar with it, but I'd like to share some of the insights I've gained as I was growing up. Let me open by presenting an overhead. <laughs> translation, as we consider translation, you know the Kentucky Fried Chicken advertisements talk about finger-licking good, <laughs> really delicious. And people have bought a lot of Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's really helped their marketing. Now, if you try and do a transliteration from the English into Chinese characters or Chinese language, it doesn't really work successfully. <laughs> It's a translation. The idiom, the idiom comes out in Chinese as eat your fingers off. Not exactly a delightful proposition. Now, I want to address today using translation as an educational tool to see how we can use translation in the classroom to aid students in comprehending English as one language they use and ASL as another language they use so they'll have cultural understanding and appreciation, equal respect for both languages. Keith briefly described some of the experiences I have in translation. As I was growing up, I learned English as a second language. I have 48 years of experience, and I'm still learning English. Secondly, I have 10 years of experience as an actor with NTD, the national of the deaf and had a lot of experience there translating plays in ASL. It really helped me to develop an internal understanding of the translation process. Now I know that one can't do translations a hundred percent accurately, but we worked on translations and kept coming up with new ideas, new ways of approaching our task. So this will perhaps spark some discussion. I don't think we'll have final solutions here today during the presentation, but it can't serve as the basis for discussion. Now, what we're talking about is using two languages, ASL and English. ASL users who see English often have a lot of misunderstandings about the language and the culture. And similarly, English speakers have a lot of misunderstandings about ASL. Good translations can help mediate this problem. There's a lot of ways we can approach using two languages as an educational tool. There's a lot of educational tools we have. Media, such as overheads and slides, transparencies, captioning, all of these can serve as bridges between two languages. But what I want to emphasize today 
is the translation itself can be an outstanding educational tool to use in the classroom. Before I proceed with the lecture, I'd like to clarify some terminology. First, translation. Secondly, transliteration, or translate. And third, interpret. You know that we use the sign interpret, and usually we're talking about listening to English and interpreting into ASL, or watching a sign presentation in ASL and rendering that in spoken English with the appropriate time lag. Now, when we talk about transliterate, I think it's similar to the process you see used by Kentucky Fried Chicken. There might be a spoken message, and it's signed very similarly, pretty much word for word, in some form of signed English. So there's a source message, and it's transliterated into English, almost a word for word gloss in English word order. Typically, the way those words are used often translate is used to mean to translate from one written language to another written language. It's a written process. And there's a lot of time available to study the source language as you're working into your target language. Perhaps 
ASL users who aren't skilled in English yet, who are still acquiring English language skills, would be confused between a meatloaf that you eat and a person who's lazy. One needs to transmit the specific message. Let me translate this. the meaning is preserved. It takes some time to explain a gloss. Wait a minute, before I proceed with that, I'm curious how many people in the audience would like me to take time to explain my sign choices or how I'm doing the sentence in ASL. Do I need to elaborate on that for anyone? There are a few people. Folks who are fluent in ASL, please bear with us, because I'd like to make this clear. We can borrow the words of English and gloss those into signs. You know that ASL has no written form itself, so one thing I could do is borrow these words from English. First, I signed this for me, finger spelled loaf and used a classifier to show the meatloaf a size and space signifier. I'm not talking about loaf, a lazy person who lies around and does nothing, the sign I just signed. I'm talking about a, a slab of meat. For him, I used this sign indicating a person set appropriately in space and showed him eating and swallowing the meat, indicated the stomach, and uh, the, together the sign had made an upset stomach. So I used appropriate grammatical features of ASL, which really helps our students understand and clarifies the meaning behind that written sentence. Let me show you the second sentence. Should be pretty easy. Right, I was suggested the children were all eyes, signed this way as the children were amazed. You might gloss that. At the circus, the children were just amazed or fascinated. Sure, another way to sign it in ASL would be this, still preserving that same meaning of, fa meaning of fascination and awe. Whether one signs fascination or awe in a variety of ways, it preserves the meaning of the source language sentence. Our third sample sentence that actions speak louder than words is not quite as easy. Many of our students might learn the meaning behind that written English sentence through a translation process. Let me take some time to explain setting up actions and words. We have actions, we have words, which carries more strength. The action does appropriately setting up each concept in space and then comparing and contrasting those. Sorry that you missed the boat. Now you could string together two 
two signs glossed, like the sign for miss and the sign for both, but the meaning's not preserved. Perhaps a sign choice like train gone, if I can gloss it that way, which is used in ASL, has the same meaning. It's similarly idiomatic in both languages. That way, the comprehension of the meaning is preserved. And the information is transmitted linguistically and culturally accurately for ASL users. So, what is the translator responsible for? One needs to analyze the source language and come up with a translation that's accurate. Sometimes a translation, someone doing a translation has difficulty understanding accurately the clarity of the source language message. There's a tendency to water down the information, to spoon feed the speakers or hearers in the target language message. Really, it's the translator's responsibility to present an accurate equivalent message. And the presentation, whether signed or spoken, needs to be clear. You need to clearly preserve the meaning with appropriate grammar. A third criteria of a good translation is it needs to be natural. The translation into the target language must preserve natural language principles and characteristics. I've been thinking for a long time how I might show an example of something that everyone's familiar with, that they've grown up with, that they're accustomed to. and analyze that for the meaning. I think a sentence might not be enough. What I was looking for was a passage, an entire text that we could analyze, perhaps a form of discourse analysis. So I've tried to come up with something we're all familiar with, I'm sure all of us have seen before.
This is why I support the idea so strongly of using translation as an educational tool to help both hearing children and deaf children understand their language and their culture and also gain insights into other languages and other cultures. I think perhaps some people here have some negative biases towards ASL as a language and a culture. Perhaps some deaf students have negative biases towards English and the mainstream culture. Through a translation process, it's easy. It's an easy way to try and gain information and share experiences in a different language and culture. I like that translation. I told them thanks. <laughs> great. Now it's easy for us to say, oh, great, swell translation. And we can translate from one language to another. It's always an easy process. It can always be done. But that's not true. Sometimes it's literally impossible to translate from one language and culture to another. Let me illustrate this with a joke I've used in my translation classes. I don't want to enter into a lot of discussion. First, what I'd like to do is present this on the overhead, and when I'm done, I'll sign it.
curious how many people here, perhaps deaf people, don't really understand this joke. Believe me, you're not the only ones. I've put in a lot of study on written English, and I can understand it, but I don't really feel the humor behind it. I think it's kind of interesting. I've got an intellectual fascination with that, and why it's humorous in English, but frankly, it doesn't tickle my funny bone. I'll try and translate this into ASL. I don't know if it'll help or not. This is the sign I'll be using for how from English culture. In English, we'd say, how do you like the egg? How do you like your eggs? And you might say scrambled or pro poached or fried. Let me go ahead and perform this joke now. Is that more comprehensible? <laughs> I'm wondering about the level of understanding. Oh, finally understand it, maybe? Hmm. Uh, I think hearing people certainly understand that, but it's from hearing culture. You know, the how, H-O-W, how do you like the eggs? And the sound is the same from the Indian greeting, how. Then that response, fried. Uh-uh, it just doesn't work. Let me explain it. Now, when I explain it that way, he greeted the Indian and said, ho, oh, and it sounds like how, so the Indian answered, fried. That's how I like my eggs. After 17 years, he still remembered exactly where they left off the conversation. So the devil couldn't take his soul. Now, understand it? Okay, great. Is it funny? Kind of cute, huh? Well, pretty good. Okay. But, strange thing, many deaf students in my class have the exact same responses to my question. Well, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying now, but I'm not funny. When I was working on the translation for the play, The Foreigner faced some similar difficulties related to humor. The class would study the play to the point where they understood the reasons behind the humor. But at that stage, all the humor was gone. It was an intellectual activity and not truly funny. So there is human in the humor in English, in that spoken language with that culture, that can't be translated. And sure, uh, if it's you attempt to translate it, people can smile, pretend to laugh politely, but the humor isn't really there. It's similar, perhaps, to the sign language joke from deaf culture, with a joke line, with a punchline, is please, but. A man drives up to some railroad tracks and the crossing guards are down across the road. And he wants to, the train goes by, but the guards don't go up again. So he walks over to the man at the gatehouse, because the gates didn't open, and writes on a sheet of paper, please, but. And the guy doesn't understand it. Now, if you're a user of sign and you sign, please, but. It makes perfect sense. You can explain that, perhaps, to a hearing audience. Go ahead, explain that to a novice interpreter sometime, or explain that to an interpreter. They say, okay, fine with me, fine. And then they comprehend it. But the humor's gone. Well, that's my...
high point, translation as a process can help students understand their culture, including humor, vocabulary, linguistic features, grammatical features. For hearing people who study ASL, certainly they can understand the vocabulary, the language, the humor in ASL. Each language has its own set of puns. And that's really an enjoyable process where you begin to understand more than one language. That's an important part of education and the enjoyment and vitality of life. users, you know why I'm using this, why I wave my hand like that. It's an attention getter. You know, in ASL, you can holler a person's name. I'm sorry, in spoken English, you can holler a person's name. Signers don't tend to call people by name. It's a characteristic wave that would be used to get someone's attention. So it's culturally equivalent. It's complementary. The choice I used wasn't, well, here we go from here. I used, well, we've arrived. We've arrived here. The part here, hello, Ben. Hearing actors could holler, hello, Ben, or Betty, using the name sign. But in deaf culture, you certainly can't holler to get someone's attention like that. So we had to make some modifications where they could walk to the door, open it up, and wave hello. Hello, Betty. Or where is Betty? The spoken English line was, Betty, my love. Betty, my love. Where is she? Spoken line, what time do you make it? Could be translated pretty closely. Brenda, Aaron had a question. I'm curious. 
as I'm watching the written English you have written down there. Uh, the spelling is really different. Instead of W-H-A-T, you have W-O-T, uh, British, or perhaps, a, I don't know if it's lower class or what, but how did you signify that or translate that? The question was in the written script as you read through it. You see a very British way of speaking, W-O-T for what? And dear, D apostrophe, Y-E-R, sometimes it's impossible to preserve that sort of thing going from one language to another. You can try it in the way you sign. For example, I could formally sign, what time is it now? Or hitting a, a different register. What time is it? Hey Amen, what time? So you could do it perhaps with register, Keith. Keith was asking me, perhaps uh, through clothing, dressing appropriately, uh, you could show some of that. Sure, uh, that's a director's decision anytime you're doing a play and that technique help, helps. But what we're trying to focus on now is the language considerations, language and culture. Uh, we're <clears throat> time is really short. I'd like to show you one more overhead. that approach. 
approach would work for you. It's certainly worth a try, but it really requires that the person know two languages. Gary Mowell just suggested that perhaps you could sign your essay and videotape yourself while you're signing it. See if you're satisfied with that presentation. If not, make some revisions, videotape yourself again. And when you're satisfied with the product in that source language of ASL, then go through your translation. Yes, Farley. Let me stand up. I noticed you're talking about classroom instruction and a method of classroom instruction. I've noticed that deaf teachers tend to really give a lot of examples, emphasize examples, and then finally get to English, an English presentation. I think that hearing teachers, I've observed, often will go ahead, give a lecture, then give examples near the end. I'm wondering if that's an important technique, perhaps, to give examples first and then explain the meaning. For example, in your presentation, first you gave examples of translation and then went into some of the more theoretical parts of your talk. Okay, I guess what you're saying is you feel that deaf teachers often will start out initially by presenting some examples and then we'll show the English, how that's done in English. Whereas hearing teachers, you observed, will present the English sentence or English discourse first and then use some examples to explain how that works. That may be a cultural difference. Yes, perhaps it is, but I'd caution you that I think it's easy for us to start with examples and perhaps makes it easier for our students to learn and comprehend comprehend. One caution is we need to avoid spoon feeding. Perhaps we could start with the English, see what's understood from the English source language, and then start translating. And after we go through that process, provide more examples that might aid in comprehension. I think if we provide too much for the students, they won't be challenged to have to think on their own and work on the problem independently. Is translation the same as presenting examples to you? Okay, to me, translation is equivalent to presenting the meaning. Oh, oh no, the question is, is to me, is translation equivalent to giving examples? No. Barbara Reholcomb. 
Okay, when the students have a script, do you feel that the student should read through the script first and then look at the sentences and the dialogue? Or do you present the translation first before they're expected to understand the whole play? Okay, the question is, when I hand out a script to a cast and we're focusing on a play, do we look at a sentence level translating sentence by sentence? Or do I require them to read through the whole script first, develop a basic understanding, and then go back and perform the translation, perhaps at a sentence level? Let me answer you this way. I think I've done it incorrectly or inefficiently in the past. I used to go through sentence by sentence translating each sentence. Then at the end of a passage, I'd realize, oh, wait a minute, that's not what it means. We'd have to go back and start over. So what I do now is take an entire passage first, understand the implications of that passage, analyze the discourse at that level, at a passage level, then go back and start translating at a sentence level. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, oh, hold on one moment, one moment. I have two articles that incorporate background information. One is by MJ Bienvenu. The other article is written by an instructor at Southern Illinois University, Dr. Tom Thor, who talks about good translations or poor translations and what are some of the characteristics. I have 60 copies here with me. I hope that'll be enough. If it's insufficient, you could put your name down on the same list as we used for the notes and I'll get you a copy. Thank you very much for